Hello and welcome to another Red9 demo. Um, today we're going to be going through the project manager and the project object and what it's there for and more importantly how the new builds allow uh, any users, not just bigger studios, to, to benefit from, uh, from the systems within this. So, um, project manager lives down here. You'll see this little cog. When you first boot Maya, when you first have Red9 installed, you'll have the cog and if we open it up, if we do a single click on it, it'll boot up to this. And the project currently is empty. That basically means you haven't set anything up. These are all kind of stub holders just to make sure that variables are, you know, are in the right place for the rest of the code. But this effectively is doing nothing for you at this particular moment. Now, as a new user, the idea is that we want you to engage in terms of the way that the tools interface with each other. Um, and particularly things like the health manager. Health manager through project manager is really useful as well as Perforce. So all of these things we're going to go through today. There is a demo already of this, uh, which is just here, which goes through a little bit more in depth about the Perforce stuff. Most of that is still relevant, um, but the demo was actually done back in 2018. So a lot of the actual way that you deal with this data has changed. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a new project. Now, um, there's a lot of API docs about this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the basis of it first. And uh, to make a new project, we literally go new project. And we're gonna call it uh, my, project okay there's my project and you'll notice everything changes now then what that's going to do is it's going to mean that this project will be the one that we boot when we boot mayor the empty one gets thrown away it never gets booted again um, and this is now a live project um, first things first is as per the previous demo we have a little checkbox show raw or un raw data the raw data is stuff that gets stored into a json file which is effectively the project if you take that off that's then the live data that's then consumed and we build the project object based on that. If you're a new user, don't get worried about it. It's not complicated. You don't need to know a lot of this stuff. But the key is firstly where this project lives. So if I open this, we've got a couple of things down here. This will open the project as a file. Um, if you've got dot .project associated with something like Notepad++, that's all the data that it's just then injected and made. Um, that's more for TDs. Um, but the main one is this one. If we open that, that is the folder this lives in. So by default, when we make a new project, it goes into our Red9 Pro Prefs folder and projects, and this is where it lives. And that's the base, base point for, for all projects, at least all projects when you're making them through the systems. There are lots of other ways of doing it. If we open up the API docs, these are updated recently, obviously the new logo. There are actually three locations these things can live, okay? What we're trying to do is make it so that when you take an update of Red9 Pro, it doesn't overwrite any of your prefs. It doesn't overwrite projects. They, these things live um, throughout all your versions of Maya and throughout uh, Red9. So that's the default location. We have a whole mechanism for what we call a client core. We're trying to get away from that because to be honest, client core is, is a separate module that we manage and we inject custom code, etc. But if you're only using client core to boot project, it kind of is a bit of a waste of time. So we're getting away from that, which is where this one comes in. Red9 project resources. This is a Maya environment variable, which you can set. And all that does is it adds in a custom set of folders. So it effectively allows you to make your project like this, copy it into a global location somewhere that all your users can get to. And all they've got to do is set that within their environment variable. So if I come to our Maya environment variable and I just unflag that, that's it, and that now means that D project testing, which is somewhere on my drive, will become a default, there it is in fact, will become a new default place for projects to live. So you can really easily re-divert these things. Let's stick with the current one that we've made, that testing one, just because we can. Uh, where are we, there's my. And I'm gonna go into edit mode. This is new, well, I say new, it's been there for eight months, something like that. But it's this is where we now edit them. In the previous video, we go through about opening a JSON file up and editing, all of that's, none of that's relevant anymore. Um, it, it got too complicated. And for, for the likes of normal animators wanting to use a tool set, kind of is a bit overkill. So this is a new way of doing it. Let's just expand this a little bit so we can see what's going on. Now, edit mode, everything, if you changed it, will turn red, just to say there's a change in it. And this thing will turn red as well, just to say, do you want to save it out or not, okay? There is a whole list of what these things do. If we again, open the, uh, the demo and we go down to default project keys, these are all the keys that are currently available and it gives you an explanation of what they all do. That data is also displayed. If we hover over one of these things, 
you'll see pop it pops up tells you what it's going to do and what it's there for and a lot of them are there for aiding in the ui so expanding the uis um we'll get to that in a second what i want to do first is i want to cover the the health check systems because this is really valid now currently the health chest health test sorry um, runs off three things it runs off the frames per second it runs off well actually four things it runs a malware test as well but it runs frames per second it runs scene up axis um, and scene units and what that means is that when you open files now this is turned on when you open a file it will check those variables for you and the, the check is run because of this thing here so it says health run open callback if that is on and I uh, come out of this if I now open a file that isn't so this is 60 frames a second in the project isn't it if I open a file that isn't 60 frames a second for example that one I get a big pink message that says I failed my health test and that is directly because oops, I've got to accept it oh in this one I can choose to ignore or fix by the way so it's saying because of that project it's past the scene up, past the um, scene units, the up axis. There's no known malware. In other words, everything that we know about that is a malware within Maya, you're fine on. But it's failed on the same time. It expected 60 frames a second. This file, if I ignore, has come in at 30 frames a second. That's an issue. Now, the mechanism of that is such that if you're running on a project and you know you're switching projects, you know, you might have, if you're a freelancer or if you're a studio, you might have two or three projects on the go. One project might be 30 frames a second, one may be 24, one may be 20, you know, it, and these things are very difficult to catch. And there's a sort of thing um, that we'll, uh, we'll show you more, uh, more in a minute when we switch over to the other folder with multiple projects in. But that's a really key one. And like I say, if you want to turn that big warning off, it's this thing here. Scene health run callback. If I turn that on and save the data, that will not run. Um, so that's the first thing to be aware of. The minute you make it, this is ticked and it will run those tests. And if you go, why is that big pink thing coming up? That's why. I'm going to leave it on. Um, incidentally, the actual code that it runs is this here. Um, this is more for TDs and uh, happy to go through it uh, in, in greater detail. But what it's doing is it's binding a specific class for this to run. And that basically means it's open for you to then inject your own test code within that and have it run by default through our mechanisms. Uh, again, don't want to go too far on that. There is a Mayor version one. We have tests for Mayor version. We've not yet figured out whether we should or shouldn't include the Mayor version test within that default health test open. Um, we have clients where, for example, we know some of them are on 2022 in Pi 3, some are in 2020, some are in 2019. Internally, we have tests that basically say, I'm running this client, therefore I should be in 2022, and that's part of the testing. It's not at the moment within the default um, systems. Maybe it should be. Uh, if you want it, let us know. Um, okay, the other big one, again, we can go through all of these in a minute. The other big one is the Perforce systems. Now then, Perforce by default is off. It doesn't connect. We have no knowledge of Perforce, and that's as it should be, because we don't want things slowing down. But if you are running a Perforce project, what you can do is we have some variables here. So we have P4 fail path and P4 project. It's as simple as ticking that on, saving that. And if you come to the script editor, what you'll see is a whole load of perforce checks. Ping, ping, ping. Actually, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> what you'll see is a whole load of perforce checks, making sure that we're connected to servers. If I come out of edit mode now, you'll see I have a list of all the available servers to me and a list of all the available workspaces for each one of those servers. Um, you'll notice that they're all kind of scrambled. I'm not going to show you client data because obviously that's um, something I can't be doing. Um, but I know the top one, for example, is Cloud Imperium, and I have two workspaces for Cloud Imperium. Um, and if I switch workspace, I can also switch streams. So you can have multiple streams, multiple projects. And what it means is that when you're switching between different projects, you can switch between your perforce mounts. All of this data is stored, the project, the connections, which one you should be, etc. If I switch between project A and B, I can switch connections. And that effectively means I can have multiple projects, multiple streams, and I can switch between them really quickly, and really easily. Now then the benefit of the perforce stuff is also in the fact that the perforce is integrated into a lot of the other tools. If I come in here, for example, I'm in Star Citizen. So I'm basically in um, I'm in the, uh, sorry, in the Cloud Imperium repository for our code base. And what I'm going to do, if I turn this on, that's off by default. If I turn that on, you'll notice we get a load of extra icons. This is a live repository. 
so this is now spun into that repository because we are connected through this system. This is now connected. These are all indicated to say what happened. So for example, these blue ones, if you hover over it, the blue shows it's checked out by somebody else. Green means all is good. Um, orange or yellow means I'm outdated. So there's a new version of that that I should pull down. And if I want to pull it down, I can click on it. I can right click and I can sync. I can revert, I can check out, I can copy the depot path. So all of the things that you would normally do by having to open Perforce UI up, you can do directly in here. Just makes things quicker. Um, that's one place. Perforce is also available through the uh, export manager, which is just there. If that's ticked when we do our exports, if they're within the Perforce um, root folders, then that data is automatically added to your uh, default change lists. So Perforce is knitted in quite handily um, in many places throughout here. Um, we said about the Perforce project fail path. So the fail path is effectively if a path fails, so if you connect and the connection fails, obviously if I go Perforce route, it's not going to give me back the correct data. So to that extent, what I can do, I can go F uh, I failed, for example, save. That's I don't know why I typed it like that. But what that basically means is if this project fails, so if the Perforce fails to connect, that will be the uh, the route that it's uh, it returns back. Now then. Let's do a few more cool things. Let's go up, for example. In fact, let's, let's before we do, let's just show you the, the difference between these two keys. Um, we have a few extra keys down here in the edit functions. And the first one is this, add unused default key. The unused default key is basically a key that we've put in that we know about that other systems talk to that isn't necessarily used by default, but you can add to add it. Sorry, you can choose to add it to your project system. Um, for example, as a browser extension path, which is pointing to a separate extension for browsers, uh, various character picker, so you can read push paths, etc. But all of these are custom ones. So I, if I choose to, uh, for example, put that one in, you just press a little plus by the side. It'll tell you the type of the data, what the key is, um, and what it's going to be used for. Uh, I'm going to cancel that. You can also add your own. The project object is really, really easy to code in. Um, it, it's, it's so easy to code in and it's so useful because we've started so that when we launch UIs, a lot of them now check the project manager because they, they pull default paths and they pull default settings from the project manager, which means that you're switching projects, you're switching all of those settings as well. Really useful. Um, right at the top, you'll notice uh, we have some type keys. So we've got dicks and lists. The dicks and lists, those are the more complicated ones. We'll go onto strings first. The other thing is you'll notice this thing here, it says about using keys. So the key pointer is a way of building custom paths up out of multiple paths. Sounds complicated, really isn't. So for example, we have export path logic. Uh, I'm gonna say that is gonna be, um, I don't know, um, let's say, I don't know why I'm stuttering here. Let's say it's gonna be source, uh, export um, stuff. There we go. Particularly complicated path. Okay. So let's, if I come out of edit mode now and we find export path, you'll find it is source export path stuff. Well, that's all very well and good. But again, coming back to this thing about Perforce, if I do p4 root, I think it's p4 root, might be p4 underscore root, excuse me. Let's have a look. Bosh. Uh, no, it's p4 underscore root, give me a second, p4 underscore root, in that, save. What you notice is that that is now F star citizen tools source export. So what it's done, we've added, a <coughs> excuse me, we've well, added a pointer to another key within the systems. And when it's built, when it builds those things up, it dynamically modifies this path. So this is being dynamically inserted into this extra path. And what that means is that you can build custom paths up from other keys within the system. So for example, you can have all of the paths be like that, and you can just have a P4 route that then switches all of those route maps under the hood. Really, really useful. Uh, the binders, binders are something that always show in this thing here. This little drop down here says nothing at the moment because there's nothing set, but that is directly linked to this one here. So let's do something in there. Um, if it says dict, it's a key pair, so it's a key equals that. So in this case, it would be, uh, 
and say puppet and equals I'm going to give it random paths that just don't make any sense just because I can't be bothered uh, my oh, my typing is awful my puppet path that'll do right save that out if we come back to that UI load lo and behold puppet is available it's going to fail because obviously my puppet path is complete random but that is now available which means again a TD can start setting these things up pass it out to the team and they don't have to worry where the binders comes from because they've set it up in here I can again use the mounting for that so if I do p4 underscore root save we come out of the project you'll notice the binders are binders there and it's remapped to f star citizen if I show the raw data it says it's p4 root if I show you the real live data, it's remapped it on the fly for us. So again, as a TD, you can set all of these up and you can have that one key that then remaps everything for you. It doesn't have to be perforce, but you can point to any key. For example, if I go, let's have one called test in there. Um, and I'm going to go test equals, and I'll, I don't know, let's have a look. I'm going to get the frames per second. I'm going to copy the key name in there. So it's going to be the frames per second, followed by that one there, copy. Again, totally random. I'm just playing with it just to show you the mechanisms. And we'll give it a string at the end of it. Save. Go out of edit mode and you'll see it's 60 frames a second and it's a red nine config. And those two are being replaced because we've given it these two keys. So it's really good at dynamically modifying stuff on the fly. Okay, so that's what that one's for. That's for this drop down here. This one, browser paths. Well, that's fairly obvious, hopefully anyway. We come to the browser, we have favorite paths. At the moment, I've just got two, which are my default, de facto favorite paths that I use. I can put whatever I want in. If I grab that, F star citizen, bosh, put that to favorite path, save, relaunch the browser. You'll see now that, hello, relaunch the browser. It's already open. Relaunch the browser. You'll see that is now in my favorite path list. So again, these things can be injected and it can be at the project level. So again, TDs can set it up, whoever you are, go away. TDs can set it up and dynamically across the entire team, they will all have that as their default de facto um, browser path within it. And that can be just a giant list that you want, whatever you want it, doesn't matter. Um, engine target, that's used for various other bits and bobs. Uh, I'm not gonna go through that at the moment. Um, uh, oh, go away. This is, the, this is the problem now. You have all of these things and you have no idea where they're all coming from. Let's close Slack down for a minute. Um, icon, that's quite an important one. In fact, what I'm, go oh, go away. What I'm gonna do, hang on a second, is I'm gonna remount this. I'm gonna close my down. So I'm gonna give it that global variable. Remember at the start I said we had a, very, where is it? Uh, uh, let's go into, give me a second, let's go into documents, Maya. And we'll go into, I mean, 2022, aren't I? 2022 environment variable. Open that up. Uh, oh, it's already there. I've undone it. Okay, that's cool. So ignore these two. We'll get rid of those. Project, Red9 project resources. I'm repointing it to D project testing. Okay. So let's save that. Close that. I'm going to restart Maya. Uh, I'm in Pi 2, this field. I'm only in Pi 2 just because our source base code is Pi 2. Pi 3 is built as well, so don't worry about it. It's uh, it's just easy for me to do it in here. Um, and when demoing, it's better because 2022 just disappears so much quicker. Um, get rid of that. No. Okay, right then. What you'll see is now, if I click on that, it'll say, oh, hang on, there's multiple projects. So before, when there was a single project, we clicked on it and it opened the UI. Now it's saying, I've got multiple projects open. And that's because we've just given it that environment key. Um, and that now is pointing to multiple projects. The, the original one is still there, the one that was in my um, Red9 prefs, but these two are now available. So I'm gonna to go to project B. You'll notice we've got a little icon. That is really useful. Uh, if I switch over, let's say we do that again. Let's go out of there. This is what I was saying about indicating the difference between projects. I'm in project A, I'm in project B. Really useful way of saying I'm in a completely different resource set than I was before. I'm in this project, excuse me, this one's 60 frames a second, this one's 30 frames a second, this project might be perforce enabled, this one might not. Um, all of those things are very settable within this. So it's a really, really powerful way of, of, uh, of doing this stuff. 
Um, that was the icon, by the way. That's what I wanted to show. The icon stuff, if I open, let's go out of that. If I open the folder that that represents, which is here, this is the D project testing I mentioned. I've just got two little icons that I've made for these two projects. Um, the icons are available by default uh, in the project. When we mount the project, we make this um, available to the icons paths within Maya. So you can literally just copy that, copy, and when you're in here, you can go into edit mode and paste it in there. And that is the one that you'll see down here when you boot that uh, that project. Again, really useful. Fail pass we've gone through. Um, post presets, these are all preset for you. Um, post handlers and post paths, this is all relating to the Red Knight anim up here. Uh, if you want default paths, this is where this gets set. If you want everyone to be pointed at a specific path when they go into projects, it's set here. Um, this one, ignore, this is me messing about. We'll just get rid of that. Uh, what else? Uh, update systems. This is a cool, good one. If you're running Red9 in, um, in Perforce mode, so uh, let's say you distribute Red9 Pro Pack through Perforce, you don't necessarily want the update systems to be kicking in. So th this whole stuff, when we have all these different builds available, if you're a TD and you're managing a team of animators, etc., you don't want them updating. You want to control when it updates. So what you can do in the project is you can turn that off. And that basically turns all of this project, sorry, all of these update systems off. So the animators don't see there's a new build. They don't have the ability to get builds. It's all controlled by whoever's distributing this, uh, this code base. You still want to know. Okay, and then finally, um, adding of new keys. Well, first of all, why would you bother adding a key to this? Um, well, the, the answer is really easy. The project object is a, is a singular object that sits in there that's managed by the switching. So when you're switching projects, all the rest of the data is switching. So to expand on it just makes sense. Um, it's a really easy way of you adding in, for example, you might have an audio department and you might have a load of custom audio paths that need to be exposed somewhere in your workflows. Cinematic department, you might have a whole rigging output that you need to expose custom keys to and they switch between projects. Again, the mechanisms are there, so it makes sense to use it. So I'm going to add a string one. Um, uh, I've set it to string. I'll go plus, which queries for a key name. Key name is my stuff. There's my stuff. Uh, I'm going to copy and paste in, uh, where are we? That one there. Let's just copy that path, copy, and we'll paste it into there. And we'll save the changes. You notice incidentally that the forward slashes and backslash is switched over. It's basically, it does a, a formatting just to make sure that things are valid. So there's my stuff. You can delete these, by the way, at any time or copy the key names if you just right click over these. And I know I said I wasn't going to get into code, but uh, this is worth doing and it's a very brief one. What I'm going to do is import, so from Red9, import Pro Pack. So import project data. So from Red9 Pro Pack, import project data. That's the main handler. And bound to project data is data. Now, data is effectively. This entire object, so everything you see in here is available on data, including a load of other additional functions. Um, but we did one called my stuff. Now, if I go my, there you go, you see it's auto completed on it, my stuff, and there's the data we just entered. So it's that easy to to add in. I don't know why I reformed it. It's that easy to get your own keys in there, um, your own data. For example, balls, and if, if we do a ball, for example, uh, check. Uh, there we go. It's a check. So it knows what type it is. It knows what type of um, interface to build for it. Really, really easy to go away and do that. Okay, so in conclusion, <laughs> basically we've got a project object. Project object manages multiple project files. These are the project files that we see. Again, through here, you can see where the projects are mounted. Um, and switching project switches everything under the hood. So it switches all of these variables. They all are exposed. They're all there waiting to be used and being used by our um, UIs and by a lot of the backend code bases is reliant on this. Things like the health test, literally switching between projects A and B, you'll see FPS will, will change, excuse me, from 60 to 30. That gets in, um, built into the health test. The um, file opens will then get, uh, get changed accordingly. It's a massively powerful piece of kit, um, and we've started using it more and more and more. Uh, we don't hard code anything now. Everything that needed hard coding goes through the project object, so it's not coded. Um, and that's it, really. Don't forget to like us uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, follow the website. The website now exposes the subscription basis, so you can subscribe to ProPack and get it and go away and play with it yourself. 
um, or contact us if you uh, if you're interested. Um, thanks very much for watching, and uh, we'll see you again. Bye.